Okay, I've got 11 o'clock. Um, I think everyone's here. Um, I may have a few people coming in um, as we go on. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Um, so good morning and happy Friday, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, we have a really good session today, a very important and informative session um, uh, given by our, our wizard. Um, I compare the work she does to uh, a Swiss watchmaker. There's a, there's a, there's a lot, of, lot of ins and outs and a lot of important considerations when importing courses and kind of navigating through that. And uh, today's session is gonna be on um, importing your classes uh, from a previous semester. And um, without further ado, I'll, um, I'll just introduce our presenter today, Ms. Leah Knowles. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Jamie. So can you see my, still see my slide? I had to move things around on my screen and I wanna make sure we're on the right page. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We sure can. Okay. <laughs> I didn't get a response, so I thought right, I'm talking that. to I'm dead air. <laughs> okay, I'm good now. Sorry about that. You're good? Okay. So you can see my slide? See your slide and hear you and see you. Okay. So um, some people are familiar with importing. You've been doing it a long time. Um, hopefully I give you a few tips today that you might not have known about. Um, but otherwise, this is going to be um, just some importing tips to make things easier for you. And what we're going to discuss today is the different options that you have for importing. You can do a basic full import. Um, importing a single item, and then some tips about cleanup after you've done an import. So let me pull up. I don't have an entire presentation for you because I wanted um, what we do today to be more of a live um, training where you can see what you would actually see if you were trying to do an import on your own. Um, so I have opened up my courses. Can you see that, Jamie? I want to make sure that it uh, is switching be between screens. I'm still seeing the importing options, the PowerPoint. Okay. I might have to stop sharing and then do it again. It just froze up. All right, I'm back. Can you hear me? <laughs> we're, yeah, we're seeing you, Leah. Okay, so I tried to stop sharing and it just literally kicked me out. So let's try this again. Um, There we go. We're seeing okay. my course now. Great. So what you should be seeing now is a course called Import One. So when you are given um, your course, 
prior to a semester start, you're given a blank shell. This is what we call a blank shell. All it has in it is what we really, um, we want to provide what you need to start a course fresh. And um, also we provide some things that are requirements for our accreditation through SACS. So you start with just this blank shell, um, doesn't have much in it. It has our getting started items, um, which are the syllabus quiz. These are used for census. And that's pretty much what it looks like when you first get our blank shell. So the first thing I want to show is what a full import looks like. And I've chosen this course. Is it changing tabs, Jamie? Yes, it is. Okay, great. So I chose this ACA course um, from this current semester uh, to uh, do a full import. So what I mean by full import is we're going to import the entire course as it is. We're not going to make any changes. We're not going to remove anything from our selection. We're just pulling in this entire course into our shell. So the reason why we suggest that you do a full import is because if you remove certain items from an import, it can break things inside the course. Um, so we always recommend that you do a full import. However, once you get comfortable doing imports, you can import, import anything that you want um, once you understand how it functions without breaking the gradebook or causing any other issues. And hopefully by the time we finish this training, you'll feel comfortable doing that. So I went ahead and did the import, but I'm gonna show you what the steps would look like. So I want to import this course. I'm gonna to come to my shell. I'm gonna to go to the gear and I'm gonna click import. And I'm going to put the name of the course I'm importing into the search and I'm going to select it and click continue. This is your selection menu. The import settings that you see here are set by default, um, meaning we have this set at the site level for you so you do not have to pick and choose through this list what is needed to create a clean import without breaking your gradebook. There are different things such as activities and resources. These are the activities that you add to a course, the assignments, um, files that you might upload, um, resources that you might link out to. These are all included in the import as well as calendar events you'll notice is not by default selected. Um, usually you don't want to do that because you want to set new dates on your assignments. You don't want to pull in the old dates. The question bank, these are connected to the, to the quizzes. So if you were to uncheck that box and do the import, your quizzes would come in, but the bank, the quiz bank would not come with it. So it would, it could break the quizzes. So you want to make sure that you don't uncheck that. Um, so doing just a basic full import, you're going to leave all of these boxes checked and you're going to click next. And this is called the schema. What this does is it shows you everything that is in the course that you're importing from and you'll see that there are checkboxes next to everything all the way to the bottom. This is just kind of giving you a little final look at this is what you're pulling in. You would click next and then the next screen would give you a button to perform the import. For time's sake, I'm not going to do the imports live in front of you because while we're doing a video, it actually could make it take longer. But I took the liberty of importing uh, the ACA course for us. 
in this shell. This is a full import. I didn't uncheck any boxes. I did just the steps I just showed you. The first thing you'll notice is there's going to be duplications. So your course shell comes with these items at the top, the announcements, the forums, your different um, books and pages that we provide. Um, but the ACA course that I imported also had those same items. So you want to do some cleanup when you're finished importing. Something else that um, I want you to notice, let me find it. Okay. I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. We have course announcements that were pulled in as duplicates in this, this full import. And you also have the announcements that were created with the course, with the shell. So there's kind of a bug. It happens off and on. Um, and what I recommend to prevent that bug from happening um, is you keep the course announcements that came with your course shell um, and delete the course announcements that you pulled in. The reason for this is um, there is a bug that has happened um, that sometimes if you delete the course announcements that came with the course and try to use the one that was imported from a previous course, it somehow is not synchronizing and the announcements don't always go out. So I always recommend that you just click delete and delete that. Um, it is random. Unfortunately, sometimes the bugs that we see are random, um, but that's what I recommend to have a clean course. Um, let's see. I've shown you the full import. Now I'm going to show you a single item. Okay, so we... Leah, we have a question. In okay, chat. Sure. Uh, uh, Debbie's asking which which one should you delete, the original or the imported? The imported. Okay, and so that's the one that comes to the blower. This, this is the original up here at the top. When you do an import, everything. So if you have uh, your shell and it has items in it, when you do an import, everything that you bring in from another course will be listed at the bottom of each module. So these items here were already in the blank shell and we imported these items from here down. I would delete the imported course announcements um, because there's something that happens in, in random courses that breaks that synchronization. And um, we have had faculty report that they are posting announcements, but it's not emailing them to the student. And what I found is they had two course announcements. They had the one that came with the course shell and they had the one that was imported and they were using the imported announcements and they weren't working. So I would just start including that in your cleanup. Just delete that imported announcement. Um, later in the training, I'll actually show you how you don't even have to bring it in. Was there any other questions? I don't think so. Not at the moment. Okay. So we're going to go back and we're going to look at our shell again. And often we have people who already have a course built. They've already got their import done and um, they decide that there's there's an item in another course that they created and they want to pull only that one item in to this course. So the import process is the same. You're going to um, go to import. We're gonna put the name of the course in. In this case, 
it depends on what you're importing, what settings you want to keep or remove. If you're importing just a file, say you want to, in my example, I'm using a syllabus file. Um, my syllabus file is just a file. It's not connected to the quiz bank um, or any quizzes. So if, if I were importing just a file or an image or even a label from another course, I don't need the quiz bank. So I would uncheck that. Then I would click next. And so here we're back at the schema. This is where you may have some little tools that you might not have known you have. Um, they're not really hidden, they're just not obvious. And that is your selection tools right here. So you can select all, which when you first reach this page by default, everything is already selected. But you can also choose to select none. That is going to uncheck all of the boxes for every item in this course that you're importing. So once you do that, then you can go find what item you want to import. And in order to import a single item, um, for one, you find out where it is. So here is the ACA 122 syllabus that I wanted to select to import. Notice that it's not letting me click. It gives me a little stop block. So you have to go to the top of the block that it's located in and select the block. It's not going to select all the items. It's only opening that block. Scroll down to the item you want to import and select it. Don't select anything else. And then you're going to scroll to the bottom and you're gonna click next. This is your confirmation page. It's basically the same as the schema. It's just on this page, you can't select or deselect anything. It's just showing you, okay, this is what you've chosen to pull in. Um, at the very bottom, you will see perform import. So I went ahead and actually did this didn't a single item import to show you what that looks like. I only wanted to import the um, syllabus and I followed those steps. When the, when the import finished, it put that syllabus item at the bottom of this module. Then I can move it anywhere that I want inside the module. Um, also, I'm going to show you this a little in more detail in a different um, blank shell that we have, uh, but something I want to point out is when you do an import, whatever is over here in these modules is going to come over into your new course module to module. So this has five modules in this course. It's going to come across into your, M, your new course module to module, meaning whatever is in the first module is gonna go in your first module here. Whatever is in the second module is gonna go into the second module here. Notice there's no other modules after that. When you do the import, it will add the remaining modules and it's module to module. A lot of people um, go to import something and especially when they're only doing one or two items at a time, they import them and then they can't find them. And so I tell them, figure out what number module it is. If it's in the fifth module, then go into the course that you imported into, count five modules and look at the bottom of it. That's where it's gonna be. So now I want to show you a, a blank shell that's a little bit more complicated. Our advanced manufacturing department um, has their own blank shell that they use because they, they have more requirements that they have to meet um, than uh, some other departments in the college. So their 
blank shell is, it, I call it Sharon's monster. Sharon Cease created this and it has so much information in it that, that her um, adjuncts have to know about that it is a very large compared to our basic um, shell. So in this, having so much information in it, it, it becomes really complicated uh, to do an import because the courses that you're importing from look like this too. They just, those courses will have actual quizzes and assignments in them that the shell does not. So people can get lost when doing an import. So um, the first import that I have, I did a full import. I wanna show you what this looks like. And this is why people get so confused. So I did the full import into this course shell. Notice, here's the shell. Welcome all the way down to regular substantive interaction documentation. Here is where I imported the MAC course. Um, no, actually, I'm sorry. This is the current running MAC 151 course that I'm imported. Notice um, it has the exact same things in it that the shell, blank shell has. Um, so here I did a full import of that MAC course. And if you scroll down, this is where things start getting messy. So to right here was our, our shell, came from our blank shell. From here, course communication down. All of this came from the MAC course. So it basically has replicated every item that was already in existence here, except um, it would have pulled the syllabus in that the shell, the blank shell didn't have. Um, also in the getting started, you'll see the same thing. It's just replicating everything that's already there. So it gets pretty complicated. Um, I've seen where faculty hid these items instead of deleting them. My recommendation is make cleanup part of your importing process. Um, instead of hiding them, delete them. If you hide them and then next semester or two semesters from now, you get another blank shell like this and you import this same course into that blank shell and all you have done is hide the items, then instead of having duplicates, you're gonna have triplicates. And if you hide those items and then you import that, you're gonna have quadruple. And it just makes things messier and messier. So the biggest thing that you can do to help yourself from an import is clean up. When you're done, anything that's duplicated, anything that you're not gonna use, just delete it to get it out of your way. That way in the future, your imports are easier to do and there's less cleanup for you to have to do. Any questions so far? Feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat, whichever one you're comfortable with. Okay, I can't hear you, what? <laughs> Just feel free to mute, unmute yourself if anyone has any questions or put it in oh, the chat. Yeah, if anyone wants to ask questions before we go further, go ahead. All right, I'm gonna carry on. Okay, so I've shown you what a full import can look like when you have a lot of items to deal with in your blank shell to begin with. I've shown you what it looks like when you pull the whole thing in and you have all these duplications. Let me show you a clean import. And what I mean by that is I imported the exact same MAC course into this blank shell. 
and notice I haven't cleaned, I didn't do any cleanup yet. This is just straight from an import. I don't have any duplications. I actually only pulled in items that I needed. Whoops, wrong tab. The getting started is the only place that I'm going to have duplicates. And the reason for that is I had to pull in the graded items so that the grade book did not break from the import. And I'll go into more details about that in just a minute. But let me show you what I did to import this in a cleaner way. So we know that our blank shell already has all of this information in it. We also know the course we're importing already has this information in it. So to do this import cleaner so you don't have to delete items, you're going to come in to your import We're going to leave this as it is because we need the quizzes, we need the question bank, but here is where we're gonna change things. So everything after the getting started module is new items in your course shell. So the course home module and the getting started module is where your, your duplications are really going to come from. So, the first thing you want to do is start unchecking what you don't need in that first module. So in this case, um, you would want to import your syllabus. Um, I believe these machining calculations are probably necessary. So we would keep checks there, but your labels, I would uncheck those. Um, keep your meet your instructor. Don't keep student policies and procedure books because we already have that. So you would just go through and uncheck everything that you don't need in that first module. Look at all the duplications that I would have to delete one at a time if I pulled all that in. Then in getting started, you can get rid of the label but you need to keep quizzes and assignments, choices, questionnaires, anything that could be attached to the gradebook, you do not want to uncheck because it will break the gradebook. But anything that is a label or just a file resource, you can uncheck that. So now I have only told this import to pull in only the items I want, not all the duplicated items that I would be pulling in. Scroll all the way down, click next, follow the prompts to get the perform import. And this is what you end up with. Instead of having all the replications, I only pulled in the calculations PDF, the syllabus, meet the instructor, and to make an appointment with the instructor. Now, all you have to do for cleanup is just to put these items inside the module where you want them to be located instead of having to delete all of the duplicated items. In the getting started section, you are going to have duplicated items because we could not leave out graded items, but now you only have two things to delete instead of having four things to delete. So that leads me to. I'm, I want to show you what breaks a gradebook, what I, what I mean by that. So the MAC course that is currently running, this is the gradebook for that course. You notice here's the entire course. It has some items here that are weighted. Then it has a category, online assignments. It has another category, classwork. And then it has a final category. Then at the bottom, you see there is a course total where it takes these weights and it um, calculates the, the total course grade based on each category weight. If you do an import 
Um, where, let me see, back to here. I want to show you how to break it. If we are importing this course and we choose not to import everything, let's say we go through and let's go to the second module. All right, we know we've already got syllabus quiz and we've got that acknowledgement and let's say we don't want that homework assignment in the next course. If you uncheck a graded item in the import and then you click next and, and follow the prompts and do the import. Once the import is done, you've only pulled in what you wanted. However, this is now what your gradebook looks like. And you notice this gradebook, where it came from, has categories. Everything is set up to calculate grades for you. If you remove a graded item from an, an import, all of the categories disappear. And that reason is it, it sets your gradebook back to the default with no categories, no weights. And Really, it's not broken, it's just reset. Um, we call it broken because you it, it takes time to rebuild all those categories and move things around. So if the import isn't clean and it removes everything back to default, then my opinion from an admin perspective is it broke it because to me, it shouldn't do that. However, this does seem to be a basic behavior of Moodle when you remove graded items from an import. So um, let me see. I want to make sure I haven't missed anything from my list. I think that's everything. Let's look at a little bit of cleanup. So this, yes, this one. This is the course that I did a complete full import of everything and it's got replicated items. Um, once your import is done, you want to remove your duplicated items. For one, it makes your course look cleaner. It looks more professional, like for college. Um, it's less confusing for students and it'll be less confusing for you um, when you start going through trying to do grading and you have replicated items in your gradebook. Um, also, it um, makes it easier to find what you're looking for if a student's looking for something. Um, it, it, this is, it's just a lot to dig through. So the second thing about um, cleanup is dates. Everything in my courses functions from dates. Um, we're talking from the dashboard to the calendar, to your quizzes, assignments, everything functions off of dates. And if those dates aren't set, then it won't function properly. Um, so the second part of cleanup is setting your dates. Um, make sure, for one, go into your course settings. Check your course date. Make sure your start date and your end date are correct. And if they're not, send us an email let us know so that we can fix that for you because these dates affect the dashboard, meaning um, if these dates are wrong, they the course may not display on a student's dashboard where it is supposed to. It may not be on the front page of the dashboard. It may show up in a tab. Um, 
and then the student wouldn't know it was there, they're looking here. Also, um, if the end date has come and gone here, then on the dashboard, it's no longer going to be here. It will move it to the tab for that year. One other thing is if you deselect this, uh, the system allows it. It shouldn't, and it's not supposed to, but it does. If you deselect this date, the end date, um, what happens is the automation system of my courses will no longer be able to control student access in that course. And um, everything functions by dates, including student access. Students are loaded with a start date and an end date that matches the course start date and end date. Um, once that date passes, it, their access will end. But if this is unchecked, it can affect that whole process. So uh, make sure you don't unselect dates in, in the course um, settings. All right, I'm going to go back. Leah, quick question about dates. Um, do you, sure. did you figure out what's going on where we go through and like the dates on the assignments are right, the dates in Cengage are right, but on the student's computer, when they pull up their catalog, it'll have all kinds of random dates and it doesn't match anything in the course. Any idea what causes that? Um, now I've seen that in random Cengage courses. And what I found is looking in Cengage, um, if you went to the course itself, uh, the, the main course settings that only you can see, not the student. Um, when you first build the course in Cengage, it asks you for your um, time zone. Yeah. And if that time zone is wrong, even though you set the dates and times correctly to your time zone in Cengage, uh -huh. it, it will alter. Um, what it actually appears as. Does that make sense? It does, but um, mine were right. And it didn't, it's just, it wasn't even like all assignments, it would just be random ones. Is I don't know, it's weird. Well, let's say you send me an email and send me some examples so I can look at it again. The okay. one course that I remember looking at um, had that problem, it was, um, at the course level where the course was created, um, it was set to central time instead of Eastern. And looking at the assignments and the quizzes inside Cengage, the dates were set to Eastern. So they appeared to be that way, but, but when you actually went in to do them, I was seeing the um, central times. So oh, yeah. that was the only replication of, of that problem that I saw. Did that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, but yes, definitely send me, um, send me some examples that I can go look at. Um, and, and we'll see if there's a deeper problem. Anything else? Okay, so um, I'm just gonna show some dates for example, right quick. Um, notice, wait a minute, let me make sure where I'm at. Notice this quiz has a date, but this one doesn't. And what that ends up meaning is students will see this quiz on their calendars. They will um, receive notifications to know that it's there, know that it's due. Um, but the solo quiz, because it doesn't have a date, will not show up on their calendar. Um, the same thing can occur with um, the choice options. 
and um, also with quizzes. Uh, that is quizzes, my bad. Assignments. It is Friday. <laughs> so um, when you go into a quiz, you'll see timing. These are the dates that I'm referring to. You, you want to make sure that you turn your dates on in your courses after your imports are done. Just consider that part of your import process. Clean up and date setting. Um, if you leave this unset, let's say, uh, let's say I had it enabled and then students did it and then I disabled it. And this is a graded item that they're getting a grade for in their grade book. If you disable the open the quiz date, from your perspective, you will still see it in the grade book and you will see the student's grades. From the student perspective, it takes their viewing away and they will not see it in the grade book. However, the grade book will still be calculating the grade from it. This can alter a grade um, and it causes confusion with the students because they can't see why their grade is being calculated the way that it is because they're missing a graded item from their view. Also, you always want to set your close the quiz dates um, so that it um, students are aware of when something is due. It also shows the due date on their calendar. If that's not enabled, they won't see the due date. At the bottom, of these uh, of quizzes, you also have activity completion. This also has an, an expect to be completed date. This date and the close the quiz date should be the same. Um, I have seen glitches occur um, when those dates didn't match. So always make sure that the expect completed on is matching to the the course quiz date, um, close date. Beyond that, that's everything about imports. Um, if you want, we can spend a few minutes answering any more questions people may have. Yeah, Debbie had a question about importing uh, small parts uh, now and then if, if if you need, need to do a uh, small port a little bit now and a little bit later, if you could talk a little more about that. Sure. You can um, import small, small parts. You just have to keep in mind if you're importing little pieces of a course, it means that the grade book is going to reset and you will not have the um, categories in the grade book anymore. Um, and there, it's not hard to replace them. I mean, it's very easy to add categories to the grade book. It's mostly just time consuming, um, but absolutely. You can, you can open one course and import four or five items from there. And once that import's done, if you have another course somewhere else you want to pull something from, you can pull bits and pieces from any course that you have access to in my courses. Does that answer your question, Debbie? Feel free to open your mic and talk. If you insist. <laughs> Any other questions? And just speaking from experience, I think the an important thing is just to take your time with this. Yes. Um, I, th I think you you it's it's once you if you do it a couple of times, you get more comfortable with it. But at first, just really look at where you're where you're clicking and and, and 
because the duplication is, like you said earlier, cleanup is a big part of this. It, it really can, because I've, I've made that mistake of, well, now I have two of everything and the bigger courses that can be really time consuming. So a little bit of preparation and just slowing down and patience can, can uh, prevent a lot of problems. Yes. Anything else? No other questions? Hi, um, if we want to use this recording at a later date, um, how would we access this training? Uh, this is going to be put on uh, the Teaching and Learning channel. Uh, we have a YouTube channel through um, that all the training videos will be put on. So I'll have a link up there. Um, and generally you can just uh, search for teaching and learning uh, on the, on the um, in YouTube at Blue Ridge. So it, it'll be posted there. Okay, thank you. I think also, um, I think Sarah was gonna send the link through an email. Yes, I will. <laughs> I hope this was not like too fast and too sporadic. Um, I, I wanted to get as much tips in in our short time as possible and still leave time for questions. Um, it, anytime you have questions, you need help, we're here. And, and feel free to email, call, drop by. We're always here to help. Go ahead, Vanessa. I just had a thought because I'm switching over all my forums from open forums to regular forums. Yes. And I want to make sure that they appear on the calendars. Can you show that real quick? Sure. Let me see if one of these has a form in it. Not those. If not, I'll build one. Okay. Nope, that's an open form. Okay, let me build one. How's that? Perfect. What's the difference between an open forum and a regular forum that Vanessa's talking about? So uh, when you go into the activity chooser, you'll see, uh, let me see, here's forum. What we're calling regular forum. This is, um, so at the core, our LMS is Moodle. Um, our provider is LTG. And the actual LMS we have is called Open LMS. Um, it is Moodle at the core, but then LTG has added proprietary tools to our LMS that belong to them, not Moodle. So they're not um, Moodle by default. This forum is Moodle by default. Open forum, where are you? There it is. Open forum. Um, is LTG's tool. And that tool in spring is being completely removed from the LMS. So the only forums we will have going forward is the, the regular forum from Moodle. Um, I'm going to select the forum. Remind me your question, Vanessa. <laughs> Um, on your dates, making sure your dates are right so that it shows up on the student's calendar. Yeah. Okay. So, so I, do use, my... um, I do use completion tracking as well. Okay. So uh, when you build your form, you have availability. Let's see. Which type of forum are you using that you want to see? Um. I've not had a lot of luck with Q&A forum before, but I want to try to use it now. A we'll Q&A. I want to, I want to do that one. Okay. So the due date is, is where you need to make sure it's enabled and set for it to show up on the student's calendar. Cutoff date. So let's say we're going to make it due on the 4th at 11 59 p.m which means my cutoff date is going to be the same oh, 
Do you have to put a cutoff date in there? You do not. Okay. The due date, yes. Okay. The cutoff date, no, you don't have to. When I've used it in the past, um, when I was training uh, our lab monitors, I used forms and I just automatically turned on the cutoff date. But no, you do not have to use that. Then we have completion settings. The expect completed on does need to match the cutoff or the, the due date. Okay. Um, so that, there we go. And okay. And now you see it's displayed where the student would see the due date, but this also means it's going to show on their calendar. Okay. So now when a student goes to that forum, they click it and then that's when they'll be prompted to, oh, so I need to go in there and add that question. You need to add the question. So with Q and A's, um, you have to ask a question in order for there to be an answer. So my so, question can be exactly what I put where you have testing and I have it there. My question yes. can be exactly the same thing. Okay. Yes. I did that before and for whatever reason, things just didn't seem to work right. But it may have been that I was using open forum. So what this means now is a student would come in here, they would see um, up here, you would actually have your instructions mm -hmm. and um, they would see my post and they would be able to click on my post and read it and then they would be able to reply. Gotcha. Okay. Q&A means- other people's until they do theirs, right? Say that again. They can't see everybody else's until they do theirs. Correct. That's okay. yeah. Yeah. I'm going to try that again. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? <coughs> um. One more question. How is a Q&A different than a discussion forum? So a discussion forum is um, like our student question and discussion forum. A discussion forum allows the students to add a topic themselves, ask a question. Other students can reply. I can, you know, you as the instructor, you can reply. Um, a Q&A is different. Um, a Q&A forum means you are asking the student a question and you expect them to answer and it can be a graded item. Um, Is there a way for them to be able to comment on someone else's after they've posted their answer? Oh, is that the Q&A? I think so. It's been a while since I've messed with the forums, but let me see. Vanessa, I think, yeah. Yeah. I think Kevin's talking too. Hey, would you like me to weigh in, Leah? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, on the Q&A forums, um, this is true on both the open forum version and the regular forum version. The Q&A forum, it's a quirky little thing. Uh, and I'll point this out, but it's not your answer to your question, but just so you know, if you use a Q&A forum, after you post the forum, you have to respond to the forum yourself. You can respond with more instructions, but that opens it for reasons I don't understand. It's not a bug, it's the feature. Anyways, but after you've done that and everyone has entered theirs, they can't see each other's, which is terrific, which is probably why you want to use it. They can't see one another's in advance after about 20 right. minutes or whatever the posting uh, uh, buffer is. After about 20 minutes, I would say, you know, an hour when, when they log back in, they can see one another's initial post. And then at that point in time, they can comment on them. Yeah. Is that right, Leah? Yes. Um, so I was going to show you in the settings, in the completion settings, you can, um, require the student to post something or to reply to a post. 
um, and require discussions, meaning they reply to other students and discuss. Um, so here's where some people get confused. If you're using a Q&A, the Q&A forum, the whole point of the forum is you, as the instructor, ask a question and the students answer it. Down here in these settings, these activity completion settings are pretty basic in all the forum settings. It says student must host discussion, um, not that one, require discussion. Student must create discussion. Um, in a Q&A, students can't create a discussion. They can't create a post. They can only reply. So in this um, forum, if you are requiring a student to make a post um, and it's a Q&A, they it will block them. They will not be able to perform the activity at all. Um, so be careful what activity completion settings you select when you use Q&A forms. All right, anything else? Okay, well, Leah, thank you very much for your time today uh, and all this great information. Uh, again, just reach out to us if you have any other questions or concerns with doing this. We can kind of walk you through it and feel free to access the recording um, either through Sarah's email or on the Teaching and Learning YouTube channel. Uh, so I, I appreciate everyone being here. This, this was a great session, Leah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, glad that... Go ahead. I just said thank you. Thanks, everyone.